So, I'm sitting on a couch about to show a Japanese anime film called Grave of the Fireflies. I'm really excited to show this film. It's a beautiful story of two young children, a brother and sister, trying to survive in war-torn Japan. But I'm also excited because this is my job. I'm a professor of Japanese animation, and I want to show my friends what I do. These friends are polite, but a little skeptical. I start the film, and everything is quiet until the single most tragic moment in the movie, when the little sister dies of malnutrition. It is at this point in the film that one of my new friends starts to laugh heartily. I freeze, not knowing what to say or do. To this day, I still don't remember if we finish watching the film or not. But I do remember how I felt, which was vulnerable, alone, humiliated. I felt like not just my profession, but my, my whole identity was being laughed at. I know you probably think this is an overreaction. It's just a movie, right? And it's true that she might well have been laughing not at me or even at the movie. It's a well-known fact that death scenes can trigger strange or inappropriate responses. And it's also true that, in America at least, animation is something that's often looked down on as something trivial, comic, something to be laughed at. But to me, animation is much more than that. To me, animation is an immersive universe that sweeps you away the moment you set foot in it. It can be beautiful and inspiring and complex and challenging, not just funny. I wanted to convey the magic of animation. Throughout my life, alternative worlds have helped to sustain and even to rescue me. I'm thinking particularly of the time when I was in middle school when fantasy worlds helped to help me to deal with the misery of being bullied by my, by my classmates. My family had been living in Europe for a year, and we came back to Cambridge, and I entered a new school in sixth grade. I walked into class a couple of days late wearing a checked tweed suit, mid-calf length, of which I was very proud. We had bought it in Munich the year before. Unfortunately, girls in America were wearing miniskirts. To make matters worse, I also wore glasses and I walked around the room, peering through them, pushing them up to the bridge of my nose. Looking back, I might as well have had a sign fastened to my sleeve saying, bully me. In any case, my classmates got the idea. Alternative worlds were what saved me. I'd always loved fairy tales and comics when I was a little kid and adored Walt Disney's Fantasia. Now I would come home from school and plunge into the Lord of the Rings or the latest science fiction novel I'd picked up from the library. Thursday evening, there was Star Trek. I believed, as a button I had from that period said, that Frodo lives. I was in love with Mr. Spock. I dreamed of voyaging on a starship to see worlds that burn and worlds that bloom, to quote one of my favorite science fiction stories. Yes, it was lonely sometimes, very lonely, but it also could be wonderful and even, in a way, empowering. Then, in seventh grade, I discovered Japan. Partly through haiku poetry, which was having a boom at that time, but also through the amazing East Asian collection at the Museum of Fine Arts in, in Boston. My mother, who was an art historian, had taken me there after I had said how much I liked a Chinese scroll at a, a Chinese restaurant, the Hong Kong, in Harvard Square. I walked into the first East Asian gallery at the museum and immediately fell in love. There were screens of misty mountains with winding paths. There were woodblock prints of pleasure seekers under cherry blossoms in full moon. 
Most moving of all were the austere Buddhist images in the museum's temple room. I used to take the subway in on a Sunday afternoon and just stand there in that quiet, sacred space. I felt transported, but also at the same time, strangely at home. Nowadays, in the age of the internet, I sometimes think what it might have been like to have had someone to share these pleasures with. I knew there had to be someone besides me who loved the Lord of the Rings, who got upset if they missed an episode of Star Trek, or just like reading comic books. And clearly haiku books were selling briskly. But where were these people? Eventually I found them, my students with whom over the years I've shared an immense array of immersive universes with. I always tell people, yes, we do live in dark and, yes, disturbing times, but I for one feel so lucky to have been able to live and work in the late 20th and early 21st centuries, because I get to teach what I love, animation, fantasy, science fiction, Japan. I sometimes wonder what those bullies would feel if they knew that I'd taken their cruelty and used it as an engine to discover new worlds that not only I, but other people could live in and delight in. But it wasn't always easy. The first time I proposed a course on fantasy to my former university, my department head said, there's no place for children's literature at a university. I tried again the next year, same response. Finally, the third year, they got sick of my pushing and said, okay, give it a try. And it turned out to be one of our most successful courses. Much, much worse was my experience with anime. I had gotten into anime thanks to Japanese manga or graphic novels or comic books. One day after class, a student of mine had lingered saying, you've got to see this. And this was a Japanese manga named Akira. I leafed through the, the book and I came across this one image, a single image that dominated the whole page of an immense black crater. I knew I was something, seeing something really different from Betty and Veronica or, or even Superman. It was dark and strange and, and beautiful. I began to think that somebody should write a book on anime. The next year, the animated version of Akira came out and it taught the world that animation could be much more than just fun cartoons, that it could be apocalyptic, innovative, thought-provoking, or all three. But the more I thought about writing a book, the more I thought I didn't want to be that someone. Far too much work. Animation in Japan is so important and so ubiquitous. It would be like trying to encompass all of Hollywood cinema. And I also had a sneaking suspicion that somebody writing a book on anime might not be considered a serious scholar. Well. Eventually, I did write the book, animation uh, from anime, sorry, from Akira to Howl's Moving Castle, the first book in English, in, a first scholarly book in English ever written on Japanese animation, and one of the earlier books ever written on animation in general. But I was right in both my fears. It was a lot of work, five intense years, and there were quite a few people who didn't take anime seriously. A lot of people, in fact. Now, I'm not just talking about the kind of person I would meet at a cocktail party who, when I told them what I did my research on, would look at me incredulously and say very slowly and carefully as if they were trying to wrap their head around some incomprehensible fact. Cartoons? You do? cartoons, you do Japanese cartoons, and then suddenly you remember someone across the room they just had to run and talk to. No, 
I'm talking about my colleagues, or at least some of my colleagues. I wrote the anime book and sent it off to Harvard University Press. Harvard had published my first book, and now I had a contract with them for the anime book, but it had to go through a final review process. The external reports came in, and they were great. One called it a tour de force. Uh, the other said it was brilliant. I still remember. But I also remember the next week when my would-be editor called me up and said, Susan, I'm not going to send you the internal report from Harvard. It consists of two paragraphs. The first paragraph is about your spelling mistakes. The second one asks the question, why would anyone write a book on a stupid subject like anime? Well, I, I think he said stupid. To be honest, things went a little hazy at that point, and I remember my, my hand shaking, holding the, the, the phone, and his voice ringing in my ears. Needless to say, Harvard was done with the book. Well, as you probably guessed, the story does have a happy ending. I picked myself up and contacted a younger editor I'd met a couple of months ago at a conference. He said, we'd love to publish the book, music to my humiliated ears. And to this day, I still get incredibly gratifying letters and emails from fans, from students, teachers, colleagues, saying how much the book meant to them, how much it meant them to, ha to them to have someone take anime seriously. And these days, animation in general is getting taken much more seriously than I ever imagined. In fact, just last semester, I was able to teach a course at Tufts called The Animated Universe. It was so much fun. I got to introduce my students to an incredible array of animated experiences from the transcendent, that would be something like Travis Knight's Kubo and the Two Strings, to The Unsettling, that would be Jan Svankmeyer's Alice, to The Wild and Weird and the Wonderful. Which brings me, naturally, to Wile E. Coyote, the hapless Warner Brothers character who lives in the Southwest and tries and fails to capture a really annoying bird known as the Roadrunner. I had always loved Coyote. I found his futile attempts to catch the Roadrunner to be very funny and very creative. But watching Wally Coyote in the, my Tufts course last semester for the first time in many years, I realized something else. I am Coyote. Yes, Coyote is a furry desert-dwelling predator, and I'm not. But he and I share something very important in common. We both keep trying. No matter how many times the rocket sleds, brakes fail, and we crash into a nearby mesa, no matter how often the little giant firecracker explodes in our faces rather than the face of our prey, we get up, dust ourselves off, and start again. And there's something else that Coyote and I share, which may be a little surprising. I believe that secretly, Coyote is kind of happy that he never quite gets the roadrunner. He actually enjoys being out there in the desert, trying on yet another defective pair of rocket skates from the Acme Corporation. That he enjoys being on his own. And yes, there are times when it's great to have someone to share the perils and pleasures of the, of the chase with, but at other times, it, it's really okay. In fact, it's even empowering to be out there on your own, with your own dreams, your own fears, your own hopes. Pursuing the roadrunner is like pursuing a dream. And wh whether you catch that dream or not, a big part of the pleasure is the pursuit itself. So this is a manifesto to all of us who dream of 
gliding on skates across the Southwest desert or visiting worlds that burn and worlds that bloom. Keep dreaming and let those dreams light up your reality and make it dazzle before your eyes. Thank you.